He was a great mentor of mine. I learned more about teaching from Mike than I ever did in any training college. My summing up of Michael was, I considered him a human encyclopedia. He was a tough individual. He played it close, played it hard, but played it fair. Michael Dunhu was born in Farnford in 1936, the son of County Clare-born parents Garda Matt and Catherine O'Dunhu. In early 1945, the family moved to nearby Castle Island and it was here that he forged a circle of lifelong friends. Naturally, we both went to the high school and got to know each other quite well. And there's many the happy evening we had kicking a paper ball around Barrack Street. Mike Dunhu and myself have been friends from the time we started school when Mike first came to Castle Island. We were the same age and our paths crossed continuously right through our life. I was a regular visitor to Mike uh, in later years when, in his apartment and I was very aware, like Tom O'Buck and John Reedy and others, of the huge collection that he had put together from uh, 15 years approximately of going to the library in Tralee every week and um, taking all the relevant material that he could find relating to the Castle Island district from the old newspapers of the 19th and even back to the 18th century. Mike was a great friend of mine, great pal. Always a bit of an argument, discussions, and one of his favourite sayings was, when, when the argument would be going up or down, he'd say, there's a reason for everything. And you think about it. And there usually was. He was right, as usual. Michael was a great friend of Billy's, but he was also a great friend of mine. Uh, we soldiered a lot together, and I found him great if I needed advice for something. And I found he was a person of great integrity. Mm -hmm. We went to the Irish Open, do you remember? Oh, yeah. I took him to the Irish Open up in... Mount, Mount Juliet, no, Dulcelen. And I said to bring walking shoes. So he didn't say what, but he brought them anyway. So we went into onto the golf course and went straight for the bar. Now he says, I won't need our shoes, I'm staying here for the day and watching television. Which he did. An exemplary GAA career also sprang from Michael's time in Castle Island and he distinguished himself at club and county levels. He went, he joined the Desmos team but it was really when he went to college that he began to blossom as a footballer. He went to the training college in St. Patrick's in Drumcondra and with Aaron's hope he won a, county, a Dublin County Championship marking the famous Kevin Heffernan. His big cry was, I held him scoreless. He was a pretty famous footballer at the time and a lot of the younger fellas would have admired him because of his, um, because of his skills as a footballer for a start and maybe secondly because he looked a bit like our, our county hero uh, Mick O'Connell. His sporting successes were not solely confined to the GA pitch, however. In the early 70s, Sean W.H. O'Connor was instrumental in uh, introducing a snooker table to the Castle Island Pitch and Pot Club. Now, um, it was there for a, a couple of years when we were sitting around the bar one night and uh, shooting the breeze when uh, somebody suggested that we should uh, reintroduce the uh, Kerry County Championship, uh, uh, Snooker Championship. It, had been, um, it hadn't been ran for a few years. And then uh, somebody else piped up, I'd say it was the late D.D. Toomey or else Sean W. H. O'Connor himself that we wouldn't run the county championship but we'd run a Munster championship. So it was ran in the very first year. We didn't know what, what the standard would be like. The, the standard was, was very good in Castle Island and Mike contested the final and he showed, uh, Mike showed his um, 
fighting qualities. It was the best of seven frames, and he was three frames to two down, and he uh, succeeded in winning the last two to become the first monster champion. Now, he, uh, after that, he decided that he'd retire undefeated. So that was his first and last championship playing. Upon completion of teacher training in Dublin, Michael took up a post at the Boys National School on College Road in 1956. In 1988, I joined the staff of the Boys School in Castle Island. And I noticed that at lunchtime, Mike was always doing crosswords. I myself had never been interested in them prior to that. But gradually, my, my curiosity was aroused and I began to ask questions of Mike about why did you put that answer there and what's the reason for that? And after a while, I got hooked. So for 20 years, Mike and I did two or three crosswords every Sunday morning. First of all in the Crown, later in the River Island Hotel. In 1996, I had a bad break of my leg and I was living in a flat uptown at the time. Mike called religiously every single morning from 10 until 12 to keep me company and we would do crosswords. Sometimes he would buy a book, a book of crosswords and the first thing he always did was to go to the back and tear out all the solutions and throw those pages into the fire so there was no way that anybody could cheat. He was very, very generous always devising new methodologies for teaching this and that at school, particularly maths and in the area of phonics. And he would always tell you what worked and didn't. And he would say, try it yourself and sure, if it doesn't work, can't you leave it after you? He retired from teaching in 1991 and it was then that he began to compile an impressive archive of local, historical and genealogical information. Every day when he come in, he would get his pint and he'd sit over at uh, his table uh, in the corner of the bar and that corner was known as the master's corner. Now there was never a week that I wouldn't get at least one or two calls from people that would want to check out family roots or local history or whatever and that call uh, as inquiring about him when he'd be, what days he'd be there or whatever. I said any day you'd call around lunchtime Michael is usually here and uh, when they would come in, if he didn't have the answer right away of whatever information they needed, he used to go across the street to his living accommodation and he'd be back within, within 10 minutes with his little folder and the answers for them. It wasn't until after his death, however, that the full extent of his research came to light. I think anybody who knew Michael knew that he was not a deeply religious man. He had his own quiet way of doing things, and that's how he went. Michael would be the first up every morning. They'd shower him dressing, and he'd be just wandering around the corridors. And all the staff would be looking out for him, everything fine. But this Thursday morning, after a moment, you know, a short time, nobody could see Michael. And they went looking for him. First thing, all doors checked, but no, all doors were locked. They searched high and low, and then they found him. In the little oratory, sitting in a chair in front of the altar. And the most beautiful smile on his face. And I suppose that's one wonderful thing to know that he was at peace with one eye on the past and one on the future then the Michael O'Donoghue Memorial Heritage Project was established to ensure that his vast archive was not once again lost to the ages when Mike passed away unfortunately without uh, achieving his goal of whatever he meant to do with this collection uh, we were worried that it would be lost uh, after uh, some time, 
I tried a number of sources to see could we get this uh, material uh, recorded and available to the people at large and, and to the diaspora. And eventually, a year and a half ago, I talked to Tom O'Book, another contemporary of ours, and we agreed that if we didn't get it done, that it would never be done. It was in the library in Tralee, but there was, it wasn't getting a priority. So we brought together a small committee with John Reedy, a local journalist, and Colm Kirwan, who was uh, just retired as uh, deputy principal of the community college. And together the four of us got to work on it. I'm delighted to be involved with it because it means that Michael's amazing work will be made accessible to uh, Castle Island and carry people all over the world, and indeed people who are interested in history. Because we're shortly going to launch um, a website and a Facebook page so people will be able to um, look up the, 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 the very checkered and very long and very colourful history of Castle Island. I suppose my first thoughts on the collection are how lucky we are to have it um, because it could so easily have been destroyed. Um, for that we have to acknowledge and be grateful to Breda, uh, Michael's sister Breda. Um, it actually puts me in mind of Emily Dickinson um, whose sister, after Emily died, whose sister salvaged her work. Um, so we have to be grateful to Breda for passing it on. Um, the content, the collection, the content is so diverse. Um, it's so wide ranging. Uh, you may find something in the collection related to the Dooney water supply, the Moonlighters, um, the Ladies' Land League, elections, you name it, you'll find it in the collection. I think it's important to acknowledge that Michael was working in a different time to us. Um, it was an age when there wasn't a Google box to, to, to type into. Uh, Michael had to work hard for his materials. Um, he had to make telephone calls, he had to write letters. If Michael O'Donoghue ever needed justification for his years of historical research into Castle Island's varied past, he surely found it when he discovered the diary of Robert O'Kelly. O'Kelly was born in Castle Island and lived from 1835 to 1919. The teacher in Michael O'Donoghue would have extended a learned hand back through the years as his eyes fell on O'Kelly's plaintive lines. In a reference to his diaries, O'Kelly wrote, They are most imperfectly written, but that cannot be helped as I am no sort of scholar. It's of immense value, and I'd like to know how Michael sourced it. I'd like to know how he came across it what efforts he made to go uh, and find it and to make sure he got a copy. And it's a story and it's a set itself. And um, it's one that we, we don't have an answer to. Um, I never knew Michael, um, but working on his documents, um, sometimes I come across an anecdote or a comment and it makes me laugh out loud. And uh, I'm learning he had a sense of humor. And I'm, I'm interested in learning as much about him as I can. Um, I think in time when the collection is published um, and people come to see and recognise the value of the collection, they'll want to know quite naturally more about Michael. So I think it's important as well to take down stories, learn what we can about the man for the future. <laughs>